Matt Emerson, I am feeling a little out of sorts and unbalanced, and it's time to get back to some of those good best practices that I always talk about and never do. Mm. Exactly. And today on Wanderings In, we're going to pack up the station wagon. We're going on a little road trip across the United States where you could in the past and still can today sleep in a teepee. Oh. Okay. Welcome to Wandering But Not Lost, your online source for finding balance so that you can align, connect, and prosper. I'm living right here and now and I don't want to miss out. Is this what life's all about? The world is calling and I'm listening. Yeah, I'm listening. And now your hosts, Jen O'Brien and Matt Emerson. You've reached the Wandering But Not Lost podcast where real estate and reality meet. It's episode 108. You can find all of our show notes over at WBNLpodcast.com. Jan O'Brien, it was great to see you yesterday. Uh, we had a little staff meeting in Las Vegas, so Jan and I got to have a little face-to-face -face time, which was exciting. We, we had a really productive day. It was a, it was a good day in Vegas. Absolutely. A lot yeah. is always accomplished when we get together, taking things to the next level. So what are we yeah. talking about today? Well, I want to talk a little bit. You know what I happened is I went back and revisited something I wrote uh, and recorded for the Wonders Club back in 2017. And I actually watched this video and I'm like, hmm, there's actually some good stuff in here that I have maybe not forgotten, but definitely have not been practicing. And so I thought it was quite a bit of material. So we're going to break it up over the next two podcasts. So I'm going to call this Practices and Tools for Wellbeing. Today is part one and next week it'll be part two. Which That's is probably a very good timing on that because I think we're all getting whipped into a frenzy over pandemics and other things That's going on now. So, so. so we're going to take a breath, calm down a little and take a look at some things to share with you to maybe you'll find one or two that work for you. And that's what I'm going to cover today. And then you're going to go over something with uh, wigwams. Can dive in a little bit there? What do you yeah. tell the listeners what, what are you going to learn about wigwam villages? I mean, I don't know. This is a pretty classic site. If you ever uh, traveled Route 66 uh, uh, over the days, there, uh, you know, there's all sorts of kitschy kind of roadside attractions along that route and uh, along many across the United States. A lot of them have been torn down at this point. But there is a uh, a motel on Route 66. Actually, there's a two on Route route 66 that um uh where you can sleep in a teepee and they're called the wigwam villages i was actually going to do a little segment just on route 66 but i got really interested in the guy who created these uh, wigwam villages and it's really kind of a fascinating story so we're just going to delve into that one little roadside attraction uh today and um I, it's 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 just a fascinating thing that they have survived all the way into 2020 so uh w w get ready to go on a little road trip all right, I'm ready to go on that road trip and uh, remember and maybe relearn and practice some tools for well-being. You're listening to the Wandering But Not Lost podcast, where real estate and reality meet. Join us and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Play, and now on YouTube. All right, everybody, welcome to part one of Practices and Tools for Well-Being. As we've been mentioning a little bit, Matt, in the last maybe several episodes, I think we've had this little theme of going on of life being chaotic. And right. frankly, when I looked at this video that I recorded back in 2017, I was saying the same words and it's always chaotic. It's always got more things going on. There's always drama happening. There's We're being bombarded, right, all the time from, I frankly blame everything on technology and right. the phone. Every, we don't go anywhere without our phones. I mean, think about it for a second. I was teaching a class the other day, a continuing education class, and I said to everybody, who in here has been practicing real estate for 15 years or longer and, and remembers actually about 20 years ago? And, rem and you do. You'll remember this. Sure. Remember how we used to practice before there was the Internet and how much slower things were? So we used to do real estate when I first got my license we had a book. We had an MLS book that was published every two weeks, and that's where the listings were. Right. There, it wasn't at everybody's fingertips. The consumers no, because in there was no internet. There was. <laughs> it was brand new. And I remember a year or two into my first years in the business, I had a little thing called a digital pager. 
So a digital pager, which, you know, like doctors would wear those and you'd be like, wow, I'm wearing a pager. And if somebody needed to get a hold of you, they would page you. Then you'd have to go find a real phone somewhere and, uh, you know, stop driving and wait till you get to your destination and then pick up the landline and make a call to a client or whoever was paging you. Now, fast forward to where we are now. And that's what I think is causing people so much stress. And I've been reading some things about how we're the most medicated society ever. Uh, and then it's because of people's mental health and well-being is, is you know, and people are striving to try to find things that are not having to maybe take some meds for it. But and that's what I want to kind of cover, talk about. And these are all things you've either heard of, done, you know, so how do we what do what can we do? So I am going to start with my first and foremost, frankly, done a couple podcasts on this. And it's the number one thing that Jan O'Brien is back focused on doing. I just talked about it a couple of podcasts or two ago, and it's design and fall with daily ritual. Mm -hmm. So I will not belabor that. We certainly have talked about it, but in a, in a bottom line scenario here is to get up in the morning and take anywhere from five to 10 minutes to an hour to follow something that's good for you and your soul and not jump right into your day to day hecticness of, of, uh, checking your emails and starting to do work chores and so on. So whether that's a morning meditation or prayer, just going for a walk, doing an exercise routine, going to the gym, uh, going through some other practices. Uh, I've mentioned the Miracle Morning by Hal Elrod. Uh, that's the one that is, when I follow that on a routine basis, it really helps me start the day right. The next one, and I've got to figure out a day here soon that I'm going to do this, and it's called Take a Digital Detox. So the digital detox is where you find a spot of time and maybe you just, maybe it's going to be difficult. Actually, you said this to me yesterday. Did you say I've been without my phone first? What did you say? Actually, it was a yeah, period of time. We, yeah. we actually had to go back and get your phone. That's exactly right. Because I had plugged my, I didn't want my phone to go, you know, the battery to go down. So I plugged it in, in the room. And then all day long, we were in meetings and talking and doing things. And then we did, you were taking me to the airport. We had to go back to the, the office because I was detached. I wasn't looking at my phone every two seconds because it wasn't near me. It was, it was interesting actually. Yeah. And, so and I didn't miss it. Well, you did a bit of a digital detox. And so taking it a little bit more intentional, the idea is to unplug from all your digital devices, your iPads, your computer, your phone, whether that's just for a couple hours or taking a whole day or a weekend. And you, you just figure out that you're going to make that work and, but, but, but try it because as soon as you start doing that, maybe you have to go in small doses, yeah, like yeah, just two step. hours. Yeah. Then you try a whole day because I, I've tried this and it's it's like uh, you have this habit and you're like, I got to go see what's happening. I got to go check Twitter. It's social media too. It's not just checking your messages. It's mainly social media. And what about this? What if you just took a 30 day, I'm not even going to post or look on social media. You know, maybe you're still using your phone to communicate with people. But anyway, these are some of the ideas. And then you can get into a practice of maybe there's uh, a time a week that you unplug, that you just get used to this. And that's maybe where you can focus on things that you're going to do for yourself. Do, right? you, have, do you have the screen time uh, uh -huh. notifications on your phone? Do you find yes. it fascinating when you get it every week? Yes, yes. Um, when I go to Florida to visit my mother, it's really interesting. You would think because I'm down there, I would have more time just to hang on the phone. The other, I got back last month and my uh, notification came up and my screen time was down 50 eight percent because i don't do that back there i'm taught i'm visiting with my mom right so it was it really kind of uh hit me a little bit i'm like wow i i, I realize when i'm there i'm much more in the moment with my you know the people i'm around awesome. and i'm not like that here so i really have been really trying for the last month to really do this a lot more and it really does it helps and, and it, when you see other people like my wife actually she fought the phone forever and now she's on it all the time and you know i i, I notice it more when i am not on it obviously right mm -hmm. so yeah i i have like my sundays are almost always detached you know, I'll, I'll, you know, and it's it, it it does change. And I have cut way back on social media. I'll do it for work. Yeah, but I, I hardly ever post on my, my personal sites. Well, anymore. you know, perhaps one of the things to do is to just really just shut it off. It's not like go put it in another room, like turn yeah, your phone off yeah. and then turn it back on at the end of the day. It's not like it's the you know why a lot of people are, I think, afraid to do this. And maybe you don't you have a, a landline. I don't. But it's it's that fear of what if something happens and someone can't get a hold of me right. that I think is always in the back of my mind. Sure. Uh, 
Uh, you know, so there's that. So, but there's ways to make that work. And here's one other on this. How about just t- putting the phones down when you have, when you sit down to have a meal with someone and not everybody's checking their phones. I mean, just look around in a restaurant and notice how people aren't even engaging with each other, even during an hour lunch or dinner. Yeah. Uh, there's a great article we have that is from 2015 that I found back in 2017 when I first recorded all of this. It's from Forbes and it's 30 reasons to do a digital detox. Think about it. That was from five years ago. We were talking about how stressed out everybody is. And here we are five years later. And I think it's actually worse. Uh, Next one, number three is get more sleep. Oh my gosh, I swear. Get more sleep. We were just talking about this, right? And if you haven't read Thrive by Ariana Huffington, and then she's got another book. And honestly, she wrote a whole book just on why getting more sleep is so impactful for your overall well-being. Just this one thing alone uh, can really change your life if you just get enough sleep. And a lot of adults will say, like me, I only need four to five hours of sleep. I don't sleep well through the through the whole night. I'm, I've always been a light sleeper. Or, what kind of a sleeper are you? Oh, no, I can sleep. I can sleep well and anywhere, (laughs) literally. Okay, well, that is brilliant because, and what would you say is the right amount of sleep for you? Uh, You know, I I feel very, very rested if I get about seven hours sleep. Seven hours of sleep? Yeah. You can, you can actually see you're right in the perfect world. Right, I don't do it. it, To be fair, I don't don't do it that often. No, No. because there's other stuff going on, right? There's a lot on my mind and all of this. So I have that same, you know, bit of stress, you know, that everyone else experiences. But if I can get seven hours of sleep, that's perfect for me. I don't need eight. I don't need nine. Well, you know, honestly, people, I think everyone feels that you don't need some. There's many people that feel they don't need a lot of sleep. But all the studies, all the medical experts are saying that is the time your body is recovering and and, and get, it's so vital to us and having those levels of sleep. And man, I swear to goodness. I, okay. So then I read and what I'm about to tell you, and I'm like, well, this is why I don't have, I do, I do the opposite of everything that's on this list. So here's the best practices for uh, getting, setting yourself the, up, yeah. getting yourself into a, a place where you're having a really solid sleep, six to eight hours. It varies based on who you are and all that kids and, Younger people generally need more. I definitely can see that with it. my little Charlie that's six and a half. That kid can sleep for 10 hours mm-hmm. uninterrupted. I'm like, oh, and I'll be checking on him. Like, are you, you know, when he's staying with me? Okay, he's still, he's still asleep. And I'm like, wow, I wish I could sleep for seven or eight hours, let alone 10 hours. All right, so here's the, here is the deal. First of all, set a bedtime routine. It's about going to bed at the same time every night if you can, so that you can have a routine where you're getting the same amount of sleep each night. Practice a relaxing ritual. So for some people, it may be a warm bath or using aromatherapy or listening to music or meditating. Uh, I like listening to when I do work on this, but this is going to have to take a lot of practice for me as I continue on with these things because check not doing that. Next, design your sleep environment to establish the conditions you need. Uh, So what's the best room temperature? See, many people get hot, too hot, too cold. I don't like it too hot. I like it to be a little cool and, and feel, you know, but I will get hot. I'll have to turn the fan on. This is all stuff that interrupts your sleep. So your bedroom has to be free from any noises and light. Uh, I used to have blackout curtains. I like it to be dark. So that's, uh, that's what we mean by environment. Avoid eating, talking on the phone, or watching TV in bed. Hmm. Don't do that one. Uh, try not to lie in bed worrying about things. That's my problem. Uh huh. So, and I know. get up. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's the thing. I really do. It's like I'm not going to lay in this bed and worry about or think about things. I'm going to get my ass up and <laughs> go do something. Yeah, you know. So, so unfortunately, my habit is if I start thinking about stuff, I use the TV as a distraction. Then I right. fall asleep and the TV's on, and I know that's what's interrupting my. So I have to go through a whole detox of my sleeping patterns and get the TV out of the bedroom. And I just can't do that cold turkey because then I'm like hearing things and thinking about too much. You know so, I have a tip for you on that that can maybe wean you off the television thing. Please, please get do. Get a face mask. Get one of the little little blackout kind of masks on your face because then you will not have that light that's uh, coming from the TV, which is actually, I think, almost the worst part of that. You know what I mean? Because you're getting the, the that... Uh, I think so. Know, that white noise. Yeah, that. exactly. Yeah. And you'll still have you'll still have the other, but then you can start. You know, you'll realize that you can't watch anymore. You're just listening, and then 
then slowly do the other thing. I found those sleep masks to be a very, very. I good know. I'll, I might try that. I've tried it. I, I get a little claustrophobic. Well, it makes that. me feel, you know. So just, I just said, like it's a routine thing. But for me, I have to. I would need to listen to something, and that's that's. I've tried this before. I've taken the TV out, or I just don't even put it on the whole. Uh, shut it off in an hour when I fall asleep because it helps me fall asleep. But then I right. wake up because it's on. Right. I'll turn it down. So I, I have to figure that one out. We're TV people. I'm never going to change that. That's all there is to it. But we do set a timer, just like you're talking well, about. So the it does go off. And then, I mean, well, now you're, you're getting right. You know, that's not working for me. I've got to, I mean, look, all I have to do is set the timer. So yeah, literally. Maybe I'll start you know, with that. I'll turn that TV on and literally, I mean, I, like I said, I can fall asleep. I'll be asleep in two minutes. Right? Exactly. So it really is almost right. just kind of a crutch anyway. Well, a timer is going to be the thing else. I'll start with the timer. I'm committing to the timer. There you go. We'll see. Baby Starting steps. Today. Baby my, steps. My sweepy gets so irritated with me because we go when we travel anywhere <laughs> in the morning. Um, or even if we're doing a red eye or something, we'll get on the plane and I will fall asleep before the plane takes off. And it makes her so, <laughs> it makes her so mad. She's I like, oh, wait, all the way across the country or wherever we're going, right? And I'm asleep before the yeah. plane even takes off the ground. It's hard for me to sleep on a plane. So I totally can empathize with her. Okay, a couple more just on sleep. Uh, avoid eating. I mean, uh, uh, allow two to three hours before your last meal, before going to bed. Avoid alcohol and caffeine for at least four hours before you go to sleep. Oh, wow. That's never going to work. And sleep on a comfortable and supportive mattress and pillow. I really think that is a big one to that. And I'm, okay. I really need to get a new pillow. I mean, a new uh, mattress. Uh, I'm not comfortable on my mattress anymore. And it, that's part of being you know, feeling like I'm tossing and turning too. So you know, think about work that on this one. For yeah, me. Think, but think about that mattress, a good mattress is expensive and it's, it's an investment, but oh my God, Worth think it. how much time you spend in bed. Yeah. It's a good point, right? Yeah. Quarter of your life at least. All right. So tips on how to get better and more sleep that, that one alone, if you just, you know, like me commit to that one or maybe I can't maybe do everything on that list right now, but I'm going to work on some of them. <laughs> All right. Here's the next uh, practice for well being and, I call it the good stuff in concept. And there's several little things in here that I want to talk about what I mean by it's what you're paying attention to, what you're listening to, where you're focusing your energies when you're not in a work mode uh, so that you can be choosing, intentionally choosing things that is better for you. So the first thing, the first thing I have here is a bit of a mindset piece. And I talked about it last week in episode 107 about you're the creator of your reality so I'm not going to repeat all that. And this just really comes from taking personal responsibility. And I, all I want to just hit on one thing here is to get yourself in the space of what uh, what is your mindset for the moment? Because if you're focusing on negative things, and that can be toxic and you can find yourself listening to negative things and negative people. And that piles on. And before you know it, it really starts to impact your mindset, your health, your overall well-being. So from time to time throughout the day, just ask yourself, what am I focusing on right now? And what if I'm and whatever I'm focusing on, is that good for me? Is it on something that I want or I don't want? Am I focusing on things that are that are causing me stress because I'm worried about this, that, or the other thing? And 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 that is just an awareness piece. So are your thoughts positive or negative? Are they moving you towards what you want or away from it? And that's just a simple exercise I'll do from time to time for myself that I'm like, wait, stop. I'll catch myself. And it's, it's not like you talk to yourself, but you kind of do because it's going on in your head. So when you're in a space, when you're, for me, it's like when I'm by myself or I'm driving or that's when all these things will pop into my head. And it just becomes awareness of, whoa, stop. What am I focused on right now? Is it what I want it toward? And then you can shift your mindset. And then all of a sudden you can, and for me, it's one of the things I'm going to talk about next, which is listen to positive uplifting podcasts or I still I have, can't tell you the last time I listened to the radio. The only time I turn the radio on is if I have to catch the Vegas Golden Knights uh, in the car because I'm on my way home and I, or the game is earlier because they're playing on the East Coast. It's the only time I turn the radio on because I don't want to listen to all the ads and the program that's on radio. And plus, there's a million podcasts out there. Uh, besides ours, um, I, I listen to our podcast, don't you? <laughs> I like to go back and listen to our podcast from time to time or just listen to how it turned out. Uh, but then I have some favorites that I listen to, and they're always things that are going to expand my horizons, get me in a great mindset, and I really love that. And that really helps. Do you find that that helps what you listen to podcasts and you do it when you're walking or when? Oh, you absolutely. Yeah, I used to listen to music when I walk, but now I only listen to podcasts. 
and there's not enough time to get into, so I've had to be selective. Um, what I've listened to over the years has changed, and you get your favorites. And it's so funny because you'll go back to one, and it'll be like, are you still interested in this one? Because you haven't listened in a while, and then you have, you have to start you know, downloading again. I'm like, no, I'm not, I, I don't have time for that. So I'm only going to listen to these three podcasts. I know where the ones I like. I can go back to if I want. You know, so it was we, kind of it was kind of funny. You know, getting back to rituals. You know, I walk every night, and last night I was, you know, my plane didn't leave until eight forty five. So, and then we got, I got to the airport early. So, actually, I thought I'm gonna, I'm gonna be missing my walk tonight. So, I thought, wait a minute, I could walk all over this terminal. So, I did. I actually walked. Did all, you? I know Terminal Wonderful. D at McCarran very well now, and I was actually listening to the podcast. So it was like I was recreating my ritual Beautiful. right there in uh, Terminal D at McCarran. So it was kind that's of that's brilliant, and you can certainly do that. So, okay, so a couple other things around this good stuff in concept it's the whole healthy eating and drinking habit right staying on uh track with that and i i think i mentioned to you i don't know if i talked about it on the podcast on one of the podcasts i listened to called the upside with Callie and jeff love that i listen to those guys daily they really make me laugh they're always talking about cool stuff and they're really doing a great job on their podcast and have a huge following they're out of atlanta but they're all over the country and world now and they were uh, kelly was talking about uh, interviewing a lady who is a therapist for eating disorders and disordered eating. Anyway, there was a book that I've got to look into because it really resonated with me called Intuitive Eating. I really have been a firm believer over the years that diets really don't work. I mean, diets work for a minute. People, right. whatever the, the latest fat is. And, sure. you know, and so I'm just anti diets. I'm more exactly what they were talking about to follow you know what you need to be doing we all know what we should be avoiding we all know what our body types are we know which kind of foods aren't are good for us so this whole concept of trusting your instincts and your intuition over yeah no that i that doesn't feel good for me or this is better for me to eat and then it's simple concepts like stop eating when you're full <laughs> drink lots of water right you know and when you think about american society you've traveled you've been in europe isn't it amazing the the what a a serving in a restaurant sure. looks like for America, American restaurants versus when you go anywhere else in the world? We overeat in this country, and you, I mean, we have buffets. We it's horrible out here. Buffet people, you know, people are just piling stuff on their plate. They're not really over eating at all, or they're overeating because they feel like they have to. But I'm just talking about go to any regular restaurant, American brand, uh, chain restaurants, and you get a, you go get your order, and it's enough for two people on your plate. Do you agree with that? I mean, that's it, it's that way. I think there's a lot of restaurants that are getting healthier or tapas, and you just eat appetizers. Sometimes I'll just go eat small plates and appetizers because that's really the portions that we ought to be eating. So the whole thing with eating and, and uh, drinking is drinking enough water. It's all the things that you know. Uh, and, and finding what's best for you, what's the best foods for you, and then just sticking with it. You know, I, I'm not, I, I'm never going to be like this strict dieter, but I certainly can choose healthier things. And I don't drink enough water. I know that's the other thing for me as well. The, pretty much everything that I've talked about today, <laughs> I mess, need girl. to get back to doing. All right, the last one for today is, uh, and <laughs> this is asked. This is under the concept. Now, this one I do. Okay, and I listen to podcasts, so I'm there. I, those things help me, but I've clearly stated the things out loud that Jan has to get back on track with. So again, good stuff in concept. Last, last idea here is always be growing and learning. Mm -hmm. It's an endless, you know, besides listening to podcasts, uh, choose the right things that you like to watch on TV. Now I'm all for, you know, once again, what if we be, you know, about talk about binge watching, right? How have we all gotten into with the streaming services allow you to, binge watch uh tv shows uh i don't know i you and i talked about it amazon prime i know i'm, I'm getting rid of cable right so now i'm because everything you need is on the streaming services so I'm, I'm an amazon prime person and netflix i still have hulu and disney plus and hulu are the same now the same company uh and there's more than enough to choose from as a matter of fact there's weren't we just much. talking yeah. weren't we just talking about what were we talking about how you and laura will go you spend 20 minutes yeah, searching. 20 minutes? We'll, we'll spend as much time as we could have watched an entire hour show searching for things to watch. All right. So i got to share something that. And we never make a list. We have always go back and do the same thing again. Now, I, but I do like uh, a little escapism and watching some things. But I also will choose documentaries and things that are interesting and I'm learning. And so 
peppering it with a little of, and there's plenty of that out there too, on really cool documentaries and things that are happening that are interesting to you or learning. Uh, but I will have to tell you the one I caught, I started looking at yesterday, Matt, uh, was on Amazon Prime. You and I were talking about things that we liked on Amazon Prime. Right. And the, uh, I just texted you a couple that, uh, that you definitely have to check out if you haven't. Um, that one that's animated called Undone is really good. I, I, I was like, I wasn't sure I was going to like it, but then I had to watch the whole thing. I shared it with my sisters and they watched it and they're like, oh my God, that was so good. So was that one flea bag that won all the right. Golden Globes and awards. It's really hilarious. It's British. Anything British is always good. But right. I started watching, do you, did you see the thing called The Boys? No. And it's kind of anti-superhero. It's Oh, I saw the previews for oh, that. Oh, yeah. you got to watch that. All yes, right, I'll enjoy that. so good. It looked, it, I actually was thinking I needed to watch that because it looked humorous. It's, this, it's, it's, a, it's a really amazing, you know, because we're fans of Marvel and all the superheroes. So this is a whole series about the the super superheroes and are in our society and they're not really all positive but they've got everybody fooled and there's a whole corporation behind oh. it and it's all about public image of these superheroes but behind the scenes they're not very super and so that's on prime cool. it's on prime okay. it's called the boys you know so maybe not the most uplifting thing but they're but it's it's entertaining and so that's that's the thing there so always be learning and growing is everything from all that to maybe taking an educational class there's so many things online like you to me Skillshare. Um, there's you could just if you want to go learn about something about anything, you, you can just find a, a thing online. You can go to YouTube and find sure. things to, to educate yourself. So that's that's all I want to cover today for this first part of uh, practices and tools for well being, and we'll have more next week. You know, you just said something when you were talking about the shows you're watching that I think is really important. You might be talking about this next week, so stop me if I'm I'm stepping on your your one of your your tips, but. You know, laughing is really important too. Uh, as far no, as I haven't. Don't have it, it on my list. It's interesting because I, the other day I was walking and I was listening to a podcast, and they were they were doing a they were bantering, and it was funny. And I found myself walking and laughing. Yeah. And I thought to myself, you know what? And I'm a lot. I think everything's funny, and I try to make every. I mean, I'm that's just my personality. But I thought to myself, you know what? I have not laughed one time today, and it feels really good to laugh. It does. The endorphins that laughing. I mean, you can't go make yourself laugh, but if you put yourself yeah. in situations where you might find things humorous, it is a good thing. It really I, you is. know, you are so right about that, and that there is a ton of studies and stuff on that as well. So just watching, choosing something or listening to something that does make you laugh can right. even can even give you a little bit of that at each day too. That happened to me yesterday again, listening to this one podcast that that I just could not stop laughing and, and they're laughing, they're laughing and then that becomes contagious, right? And yeah. then I'm just driving in my car and I'm like laughing like crazy, but it does feel good, right? I mean, not to kick this dead horse, but I will <laughs> never get tired of the pack the car commercial because it makes oh me laugh God. every time. You know, the pack the car. So oh. I actually said that yesterday when I was getting in my car and I was like, I was mad at my car for, for a minute and I was like, you know, something about this, this damn car, you know, whatever. It was like something was happening. I couldn't open a car and I was like saying, I was using some of that same stuff. It was me. And, and I'm telling you that that commercial clearly is very, very popular. You know, we, when we were driving to the airport, you were, we were, because you can't see, you would ask which way was to Depatches. And the patches are over here in that lane. So we went to Depatches, right? But it was funny. Last night on the plane, the stewardess actually, uh, she was doing her little spiel and she said something. Actually, I don't even know how she got departures into her spiel because what the hell was she talking about? But she said Depatches. And I swear to God, everyone Here around me started, every Everyone started laughing. And then when she walked down the aisle, they asked, are you from Boston? And she said, no, I'm actually from Baltimore. She goes, but I have a little, every once in a while, some of those words come out and they, and it did. And it was just, it was like all of a sudden on this little plane where no one knows each other, or there was a conversation going on about that commercial. So, uh, you know, and it made me smile. It was funny. It's a ghost cat. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a smart pack. See, I mean, there's now they've taken that just clips of that, right? So they've taken that whole uh, commercial like they do, and it's just a condensed version that has the, all the best bits in it. And I'll stop and we'll actually watch that commercial every time. So well done, Hyundai, Hyundai, Hyundai. Yeah, exactly. Hyundai Sonata. See, we know what the car is about. The car. The America car. is woke to the Boston accent. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, and it's the best thing ever. Yeah. All right. It is the best thing ever. <laughs> Good stuff. Oh.
Come take my hand and see the world around you. The time is right, just let the light surround you. And step by step, you feel it coming alive. The feeling deep down inside. The best memories are made when you take the road less traveled. Visit wanderingbutnotlost.com for some inspiration. Today on Wanderings Inn, we are going to hit the road, uh, partially on Route 66, but also other roads across America. Back in the 30s and 40s was kind of the heyday of the American road trip. Uh, everyone was, uh, at that point, everyone, almost everyone anyway, had a car. It was get out on the road and, and, and live the good life. And along the, the the roads, of course, people were looking for opportunities and uh, uh, ways that they could uh, make a buck on the people that were crossing the country. And a lot of roadside attractions popped up, you know, kind of during that that time uh, in America. And uh, one in particular has uh, really become kind of iconic in, in a lot of ways, and that is the TP Motel. Uh, they're actually called the Web Wigwam Hotels. There's one in Arizona, which I think there's still a, uh, a a motel that you can actually stay at uh, now. Uh, and if if you haven't, because Jan, we were talking about this, you you actually hadn't seen that before, no. or, or it didn't sound familiar to you, right? Mm -mm. This might sound familiar to you, because it, it is paid homage to a lot in, in movies and stuff. If you think about Disney's California Adventure Cars Land, yeah. the, the Cozy Cone Motel, yeah. That is actually patterned after the wigwam hotel, right? So instead of oh. wigwams and teepees, it's cones. So that is a uh, little homage to the uh, to the the wigwam motels. But the wigwam motels actually started not on Route 66. They started uh, and were created by a man named Frank Redford, and he grew up back in Kentucky. <clears throat> and I found this to be the most interesting part because it seems like I I gravitate towards and are attracted to things around national parks. And there is a connection between the Wigwam Motels and um, national, uh, the Mammoth Cave National Park in Kentucky. Uh, Mammoth Cave uh, became a national park back in the mid-20s, I believe, or, or early 30s when it actually opened to the public, but it was classified earlier. Uh, and it's one of the largest cave systems in the world, actually, that is known, uh, and, and uh, tourists can go there. I haven't been to Mammoth Cave, but I always love to get back there. Anyway, he grew up not more than maybe 12, 15 miles from Mammoth uh, Mammoth. Uh, Mammoth Cave, and it was becoming more of a tourist destination and more people were coming down there. So he got in his head that he he always had a, an appreciation and a respect for the Native Americans, had a lot of, 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 uh, of uh, memorabilia and things he collected from uh, Native Americans. And he thought, you know what, I'm going to build a lunchroom. Uh, that's on the road that goes to Mammoth Cave. And I'm going to have visitors stop in and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to capitalize on the tourist crowd that's coming through Kentucky. So he built a teepee shaped uh, lunchroom. It was pretty small. It wasn't a huge, huge thing, but he would serve food in there, you know, breakfast and lunch, you know, dinner and his things. Then he had, and, and as it became more popular, he started kind of adding on to that. He had a gas station, a little wigwam gas station. Uh, or TP gas station. It's kind of funny. And there is a very big difference between a TP and a wigwam. All of he didn't for some reason like the word TP. I don't think there was ever anything I've actually read definitively that said why he liked the word wigwam over TP. Mm -hmm. But a TP is the classic kind of conular uh, shaped uh, uh, structure. A wigwam is actually this. It's built out of the same kind of materials, but it's more of a dome shape uh, structure, mm -hmm. like an igloo really is more what a wigwam is but so forget the nomenclature here he called them wigwams <laughs> i'm gonna call them teepees the rest but of it time is really. but they yeah. are teepees right yeah uh, and actually i think wig wigwam is a it's the word is well they're both kind of fun words to say but uh must maybe it looked good on the sign who knows but uh so we had a gas station there so it was a lunchroom at a gas station he built two little wigwam bathrooms or tp bathrooms there next to the gas station okay. and one was for the squaws and one's, one was for the braves and um mm -hmm. as time went on he he decided he, you know, this he could maybe even expand it out a little bit more. So he actually added uh, a few motel rooms there as well. I think on that particular one, he had um, six motels uh, or six rooms at his little wigwam village. And he called it the wigwam village. And his uh, little, uh, uh, you know, catchphrase was, you know, sleep in a teepee, actually. So there was a teepee in there. Anyway, uh, just a few years later, it was becoming so successful. He thought, you know what? I'm going to pick up the <laughs> this concept and I'm going to move it down the road closer to uh, 
the uh, national park and he opened up wigwam village number two so there were two within five miles of each other so he already had like a little chain going here where he kind of laid out his design for what these wigwam villages were going to look like and they all centered around a usually a gas station a kind of a main lobby type of uh of tp and then there were in the his initial design kind of a a horseshoe type of configuration of about 15 motel rooms with a open space in between where there was barbecuing and there were fire pits and things like that. So in the evenings, families could come out and kind of relax and enjoy themselves. So wigwam number two, right there in uh, Kentucky as well. So he decided that this was such a great thing that he was going to open up wigwam uh, villages across America. So he actually applied for his patent back in 1936. Really? Yeah, to get the patent on the wigwam TP design and kind of the design of the hotel property and started selling franchises. So there are actually are at the culmination of his uh, his business here between 1933 and I believe uh, 1958 is when he passed away, if I'm not mistaken. Um, there were seven wigwam villages that were actually built. He built the first two there in Kentucky. He built actually wigwam village number seven, which we'll talk about for a minute, but or in a minute. But the other um, four wigwams actually were franchises. the uh, The largest wigwam village was actually in Orlando, uh, Orlando. Florida, well before Disney World and all the theme parks started happening down there. But uh, a person got the franchise, opened a wigwam with 27 TP uh, motel rooms down there, all just really, really popular. Because if you're driving by, especially if you have kids, right, sure. uh, and looking for a place to stay, they were super kitschy, super, oh my gosh, I got to go check out and see what that's, you know, see what that's all about. There's only three that are still, um, uh, uh, open or you can go to today yeah the wigwong village number two the second one that he built there near mammoth cave is still open uh that he actually built uh wigwong number six the one there in uh in arizona is still open for business and then there's one out here in san bernardino and that's how i stumbled on this my, my uh, sweet pea and i were out kind of traveling route 66 in southern california and we were driving by and i had heard that there was there there was a wigwong village here in california but i thought it was closed and we we, we pulled up to it there's pictures in the show notes over wbnlpodcast.com uh it is awesome I mean, it's not in the best area right now, so I don't know if I'd want to actually stay there, quite frankly. But they have renovated that place. The we, there was one open; they were actually cleaning one. Super clean inside. Yeah, what just, is it? What is it? I, I, I'm dying to ask you. What does it look like inside? Is it like a beds or? Cot yeah, it's really it's really cool. I mean, so is it a room? Is it? Yeah. How many people can sleep in one? Yeah, they have. Diff they have like I think there are two or three different size teepees and different. Uh, you know accommodations inside everyone's got a little little restroom so it's got a little shower i mean little because you know <laughs> the shape of these things right and they're not huge you'll see if you go to the show notes but super cool a little bathroom a little shower and uh, uh toilet in there and then there are some that have just a twin bed and a uh couch area and a little table wow uh there's one that has two beds in it not the yeah. way the native americans live now okay uh, None of this was the way the Native Americans did it. Absolutely not. As a matter right, so, of fact, so you're basically describing put a motel room in a teepee. Yeah, it really basically it basically was that. Right. You know, okay. this one I, I I have to say this one in San Bernardino. If you're ever out in Southern California and you have a car and you feel like seeing something unique, it is really cool to go see that. It was it, uh, and the the guy at the front desk. Um, uh, I don't know if he was a family member or not. Might have been. Uh, uh, you, you, you know, was giving us history about that and about the renovation and, you know, how it really kind of gone into disrepair. And they they came in, bought it and read really, uh, uh, you know, gave it a complete overhaul. And I'm going to tell you, it really looks it's nice. I mean, it really is. Like I said, if it wasn't for where it's located, I would be staying there in a minute. You know, it's, it's just a very cool thing. And I'm not saying, experience. and I'm not trying to say don't, you know, that it's like, you know, in some crime ridden area, it's just out. It's just really not a place. I guess the point is you're not going to stay there and go to Disneyland or you're when not going to stay, you're gonna stay there built. and go to the beach. Yeah. When it was, so when first, it was first built, it was out in the middle of probably what? Orange, orange groves. groves or, yeah. yeah. And there were some pictures of that, that he had in the lobby that was just, you know, so cool. 
cool to to see that. So Frank uh, Redford, you know, he he kind of had his American dream come to fruition, right? He didn't start a huge chain like his, you know, his original intent was, but he did have people that would buy his franchises. They, for the most part, because it was an open franchise, so you know they could you know use the name and do all that kind of stuff, just pay him a royalty, which is what a franchise is. But they most of them even stuck to his original design, except that one in Florida where they built more teepees. Most of them stuck to that fifteen uh, teepee design and kind of the horseshoe shape and and uh so you know he had a little dream you know that came to fru uh, to fruition Do he you... actually he built the one out there in san bernardino that's wigwam or uh yeah well it's on the the border of san bernardino and rialto on route 66 he built the, that one himself wigwam village number seven he actually built a larger wigwam behind kind of the lobby area there and uh and made it an apartment and actually he lived there at that particular wigwam village mm. until he passed away so uh wow. you know he, he was he was committed and loved what he had done I, it was hard to find a lot of information about really his total backstory you know i, I always you take a step back and say situations like this, because, you know, this is one of those things where I, and I always think it's good to reflect and do a little more research, right? You know, was he capitalizing and taking advantage of the Native Americans is what I, you know, the first thing I started thinking about, because I'm, I'm not going to go out and promote and talk about someone who, you know, was, his intentions were not really good, right? But the more that I, the things I could find out about him were actually very positive. So he wasn't making fun. It wasn't a situation where he was, uh, you know, uh, showing disrespect. He did have a lot of Native American artifacts. He uh, actually employed a lot of Native American uh, people earlier on to actually, you know, help with the, the construction and also work in the places. Now, you know, once again, was he just going to trot out the Native Americans to get people in? I, I don't know. But, you know, no matter what we, you know, you know, our society has changed a lot over the years about how we look at things. But these are just classic uh, structures of the time. And like I said, you know, they have been oh in countless movies and even in theme parks now. So right. if you have a chance to check out either the one in uh, in Arizona, check that out. Check out the one in San Bernardino. It's worth the extra little drive off the interstate to go check out the uh, one of. Uh, Frank Redford's Wigwam Villages. You're listening to the Wandering But Not Lost podcast, where real estate and reality meet. Join us and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Play, and now on YouTube. Well, that's a wrap for episode 108 of the Wandering Without Lost podcast, where real estate and reality meet. You can find all of our show notes over at WBNL Sheldon, your tail is in my face, dot com. <laughs> Jan O'Brien, I uh, am enjoying your well-being tips. I'm thinking that uh, uh, everyone could could take a couple of those things to, you know, kind of enhance their their life and get a little bit back into their moment of sin, right? It's pretty timeless right now for our times. And oh, yeah, I'm very happy to have gone through that today again mostly for myself to have the reminder. It's and a, another I, therapy I, I, session. It's another self-therapy session. I hope you found a couple things in there that are going to help you and uh, a few more next week to wrap up this two-parter on practices and tools for well-being. All right. Until then, be forever wandering, but not lost. 